So I've got a bit of a, a fun message today to start with. It's nothing to do with cooking today. <laughs> and I'm breaking all rules of writing um, sermons as well. Um, I don't have three points. Yeah, no, it's a bit wrong, isn't it? Um, so yes, I'm going for two points. I'm also talking about two animals. So we're going for two today. I feel like we're on Noah's Ark. That's pretty cool, isn't it? <laughs> So the title of my sermon, Don't Be a Galah. So galahs are actually a native Australian bird, if anyone didn't know that. Uh, originally, I think they were found in something like Lightning Ridge or out north, northwest, is that right, of New South Wales. I used to have a hand-tamed galah named Charlie Bird. Um, he was quite a funny little bird. That, that's not actually him, but he was actually better looking than that. I couldn't find a really nice photo of him, unfortunately. Um, but yes, he was a lot, uh, a lot more pretty than that. Um, and he used to show off all the time. Anytime I took him to go and get his wings clipped or nails done, he would just sit there and just go, Charlie Bird, Charlie Bird, Charlie Bird. He was in charge of everything. Everyone loved him. Um, he was always fun to play with until he got too excited. He'd be sitting on my shoulder and he'd start to eat my hair. I was like, oh, okay, that's not fun. <laughs> but he would also copy everything he heard. And that's part of the parrot family. They don't have any original ideas. They just copy everything around them. Um, when we actually got um, Charlie Bird, he, was, he had been living in a house uh, which was a share house of five people. My stepdaughter was one of those. Um, and so it was so hilarious. For the first few weeks of when we had him, he just slowly regurgitated every conversation he'd heard. He had no idea what he was saying. He was just blah, 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 blah. blah. And because we knew all the five people in that house, we actually knew exactly which person he was imitating. <laughs> and at that time as well, my stepdaughter had a cold, so you always knew when it got to her. <coughs> Charlie Bird. <coughs> All right, that's Jessica. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's glass. Glass can be fun. They can also be annoying. And I'll just give you some de details about them from Echidna Walkabout Tours. They're seed eaters. They're often seen feeding on grass seeds on the ground. They also eat seeds from many shrubs and trees. And they're good seed dispersers. Um, so they'll be carrying them around, eating them, half eat them and drop them. And then we get trees. Beautiful. Um, they can travel and roost in flocks of up to a thousand birds. That's huge. As I said, they just do everything everyone else does. They just follow each other. They're all in the crowd. But it would probably be an impressive sight to see a thousand birds just flying along. They can get up to seven... 70 kilometres per hour. Wow. That's pretty fast. They're powerful and acrobatic, and they think nothing of doing loop-to-loops and ducking through branches at speed, all in a show of their era mastery. <laughs> Remember I said Charlie Bird likes to show off? That's the galah way of doing things. <laughs> watch me, watch me. We also know that the word galah is used in Australia for a silly person, a bit of a clown. So someone's being a bit silly there being a galah. This is thought to have come from the many little antics of, silly antics of galahs. Um, though highly intelligent, they often play the fool. Hanging upside down on branches, sliding down wires, tumbling and wrestling each other on the ground and doing somersaults and playing with toys. And we used to have that often with Charlie Bird, that all of a sudden we hear the screeching and squawking, we're like, what's wrong? And we go out and there he is, hanging upside down, on his perch, in his cage. Go, what are you doing? <laughs> okay, all right. Very highly intelligent. I don't see how that's highly intelligent, but anyways. <laughs> now to my second animal. We're going to look at the sea eagle. So again, I'll give you a few little bits of information from National Parks New South Wales. They can be easily identified by their white tail. Oh yeah, there is a white tail, good. <laughs> and dark grey wings. These raptors are often spotted cruising coastal breezes throughout Australia, hence the name sea eagle, and make for some scenic bird watching. They're powerful Australian birds of prey and they're known to mate for life, return each year to the same nest to breed. They're often spotted by bird watchers in coastal regions and sometimes around large lakes and inland rivers throughout Australia, with powerful talons and hooked beak and a wingspan of up to two metres across. This Australian raptor is a skilled and deadly hunter. Also known as a white-breasted sea eagle, these powerful birds of prey feed on snakes, turtles and other birds, even flying foxes. That's pretty full on. Yeah, so then they are, they are friendly, but they're not really friendly. So why am I talking so much about galahs and sea eagles? One day we were uh, visiting some friends of ours on the central coast, and they have a very large backyard. And in this backyard, lots of trees, some beautiful garden areas, 
a nice little gazebo that we like to sit in and enjoy the afternoon. Um, and we'll pretty much always we'll be sitting outside when it, the weather is, is, is good. And this particular day, there was um, all of a sudden all this screeching and squawking happening. And we like looked up and went, what's going on? And here came a sea eagle perched in one of the trees, followed by 12 galahs. So these 12 galahs were chasing the sea eagle. I don't know what they thought they were going to do, but anyways. So the glass were flapping away, making such a noise as they were trying to chase the sea eagle, and they had to keep stopping at many trees along the way because they'd flap and then they'd get tired. And the sea eagle would just one or two flaps onto the next tree. And when we saw it in the tree, what do you reckon, Chris, about that big? We had no idea what it was at first. Here's this thing just standing in, like, on the tree, and we're going, holy dooly, look at that thing. Then it will get up in one or two flaps, and there it was in the next tree. While the galahs are doing this. <laughs> Not getting anywhere. But just imagine, even if they did catch the sea eagle, what were they doing? So, as I said, um, the sea eagle just kept moving along with one or two flaps of its wings. Then, um, it w wasn't much longer than that, then it just kept gliding higher, another one or two flaps, and then it get higher and higher to a point where we couldn't see it any further. It caught a nice thermal air current and off it went out west. So I'm going to get uh, Matt to come and help me here. If you want to stand on that square there. Yep. Now, first of all, two metres was the wingspan. That man is 1.95. <laughs> I just found out. I went, yes, awesome, one, two, three, four. Okay, so the wingspan is between Matt and I. That's the wingspan of this animal. Thank you so much, 1.95. <laughs> By the time it was gone, we could see it and it was this big. That's how far up and far away from us it was. Its wingspan is meant to be this big. It was looking that big up there. So let's have a, look, a think about those uh, galahs in, the in, in this story. And they're flapping about and getting nowhere. They thought they were able to catch the sea eagle. As I said, I'm not sure what they were going to do once they got to the sea eagle, considering here it's flying foxes. Um, and the sea eagle just effortlessly glided away from the screeching to a peaceful place of floating. This was the point where I first ever fully understood Isaiah 40, 30 to 31. Even young people faint and get exhausted. Athletic ones may stumble and fall, but those who wait for Yahweh's grace will experience divine strength. They will rise up on soaring wings and fly like eagles. Remember that flying wasn't flapping. It was just gliding and floating. They'll run their ways without growing weary and walk through life without giving up. So this passage was actually written at a time when the Israelites had been in exile in Babylon. They were weary from all the hard life they'd been living. God's promise to them through the prophet Isaiah was that if they stopped, waited for God, he would give them the rest they needed. It would be effortless gliding as the eagle does in that thermal air current. It would be so effortless their strength would be renewed. So think about the reference to the young people and the athletic ones. That shows that even the most physically fit of them were feeling exhausted from what they'd just been through. Remembering it's not those who work for God that will experience divine strength. It's those who wait for God. This waiting is resting, stopping. And we know that rest comes from God. God created the Sabbath, as we've been um, sharing with you guys over the, this series. Um, it wasn't our idea, even though we'd love to say it is. It wasn't you version's idea, even though they jumped on the bandwagon with us and they're putting out lots of uh, Sabbath verse. Even this morning was another Sabbath verse. It wasn't the Israelites' idea. It was God's idea. And he demonstrated from the very beginning when he rested on the seventh day of creation. The Sabbath is for us to recharge and rest with God, not for us to tick boxes and feel good about ourselves because rest comes from God. So let's go back a little bit further in the journey of the Israelites. <clears throat> I've got my inspiration here from Lisa Harper, a speaker in um, America. And the Sabbath was something that God instructed the Israelites to do when they came out of Egypt. We're seeing a bit of a pattern here. They came out of Egypt and God talked about rest. They came back from Babylon and God talked about rest. Hmm, maybe the Israelites should have listened. <laughs> but in Egypt, they were used to working 24-7, being on call for the Egyptians to do any hard labor that was necessary. They probably lived in fear and exhaustion every day. 
God then brought them out of Egypt and said, now you must learn how to rest. God wanted them to stop and appreciate what he had created them for, to be with him. He wanted them to understand that they were loved for the fact that they were God's children, not hard workers. He wanted them to sit around the table together, love each other well, eat well. And I love how Lisa Harper at this point actually says, um, is, is there a reason that God calls himself the bread of life? He wants us to eat well. Forget the calves. Just feast on them. We need to remember how much God loves us, and that's what he wanted for the Israelites. Exodus 33, 14, this is a lovely promise from God. I will personally go with you, Moses, and I will give you rest. Everything will be fine for you. The rest came from God and is with God. God wanted to bless Moses and the Israelites with their rest. As I said, rest comes from God. It isn't something we can give ourselves. God also has given us the Holy Spirit to help guide us in this rest. Flying like an eagle, like that sea eagle, doesn't take much effort. Being a galah does. Don't follow the crowd and imitate those around you. Be countercultural and rest with God. Don't imitate the words and actions of those around us. God is the one that gives us this rest, the soaring, the floating, the gliding. It's so easy. We don't have to flap aimlessly trying to save ourselves or catch the next best thing. When we rest and leave our stress and flapping and jump with God on this thermal air current, we are able to continue through no matter what life is like, no matter how hard it is. We've been given the strength by God as we rest in him to continue on. It is his rest that energizes us. God's already done all the hard work through Jesus' death and resurrection. Why do we have to keep working? We don't. We need to stop and rest with God. In Mark 2, 27, Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made to meet the needs of the people and not the people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. God created us. He knows how we tick. He knows how the body and the mind works. And God knows we need time to stop and to listen to him. Wait. Float. And glide. So we need to float on that thermal air current of Christ. And if we look at Psalm 37, 3 to 5, Trust in the Lord and do good. Then you will live safely in the land and prosper. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desires. Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him and he will help you. Jumping on the thermal air current of Christ. It's a bit of a risk, isn't it? Letting go. Remember I said it's not those who work that will receive that rest from God. It's those that wait. And air current is always moving. That's how that sea eagle got to be that big in our vision rather than that big. It keeps moving. God keeps moving. God is always moving even when we are resting. We're to trust God with all our worries, all our tiredness. Struggles in relationships. This is the feeling of floating on that thermal air current of Christ. He will hold you up. Again, think about that eagle. He wasn't sinking. He just kept going higher and higher. Jesus will carry you. When you've got no strength left, Jesus is there to carry you. <coughs> God wants to give you the desires of your heart. He is a good God. Rest in him allows you to receive those promises. This can feel like a great risk to let go and not try to do things ourselves, not flap around. Don't be a galah. Let God carry you and give you that resting time. Through that, God can bring breakthrough. God can restore your mind and your body. That will then give you time and the energy to make godly decisions, to be able to think clearly and to hear the Holy Spirit. If we're too busy, we're not going to hear that. We're not going to know that. Don't be a galah. Don't try to do it all yourself. 
Take that leap and trust God with your circumstances, with your troubles and rest in Him. Be an eagle and float with God. Let Him take the reins. Just some practical ways to think about how can we experience this God-given rest. Don't have a to-do list on your day off. I used to do that all the time. And I get to the end of the day exhausted and go, yes, look how many things I've done. This is great. Don't think you are the one to do everything. Times when I've tried to rush things, I want, it, I want this to happen, I want that to happen, I better go and do it. Sometimes it's even resulted in arguments with loved ones and me being stressed because it didn't match my timetable. There's a reason for that. Wait for God's timetable, not ours. Listen to worship music. Be in God's creation. Let God know you appreciate his creation, not just the animals and the vegetation about you, but you, his child. He, he loves you and he created the Sabbath for you. It doesn't have to be anything profound when you talk to him. You don't need to study for years. You don't need to read a library full of books. You don't need to take exams to meet requirements to speak to God. Just think about that song we just sang. All that I have is a hallelujah. All God is asking for is your hallelujah. Get some people around you to feast. That's our whole theme this year, feast. Get together and eat some good food. Don't let me cook it for you. Share with the people around you what you're grateful for and remind each other like he wanted the Israelites to do. Remind each other you are his creation and he loves you. Remind each other of those important points. If you want to know this God that we're talking about, Maybe it's a relationship you haven't yet had. Maybe it's a conversation you haven't yet had. And you don't want to be a galah. I want to give you this opportunity now. Um, all heads bowed, eyes closed. Um, if this is you, that you think it's now time to, um, to commit to this God who wants to give you rest. Commit your timetables to Him. You want to get to know this God who created the Sabbath for you. If that's you, just raise your hand so we know we can pray with you and we can support you. pray a prayer together It'll be up on the screen Jesus this is my decision today I say yes to you you died on the cross to pay the price for my sin I invite you to be my saviour come into my life forgive my sin fill me with the power of your Holy Spirit to pray for another group of people today if you know this God you have a relationship with him you talk to him often but you want that rest and you want to stop being a galah you want to give him everything you want to jump on that thermal air current with God I want to pray for you now you want to accept God's rest take that risk so let me pray for you now Heavenly Father, I just pray for all of us to stop being Goliath, stop flapping about, stop screeching, and stop copying the world around us. Lord, give us the strength to be countercultural. Lord, the strength to jump on that thermal air current of Christ. And I want you all right now to visualize with your eyes closed, giving everything to Christ. He's going to carry that while you float. Wait and glide. And Holy Spirit, we just pray for clarity in situations that we're all in, situations we need to let go of the reins of, Lord. Now, Holy Spirit, you will just speak to our hearts. Let us understand how we can clearly think to take that rest, that rest that only God gives, but also rest that God wants for us to have. And we thank you, Lord, that you love us so much that you don't want us to keep flapping around like galahs, but to float and soar in your strength. And Father, I just pray for restoration of strength, mind and bodies, Lord. And we just thank you in Jesus' name.